So we have that four minutes for your opening statements. And then you're each going to get five questions from the questions each of you has written on the cards distributed on your arrival. And then you're going to each have two minutes of closing statements. Okay, we're ready. Megan, get on our mark, get set, go. All right. Hey, we're going to start with the Democrats. And we drew by random draw. We're going to start with Justin Brannon. And we're going to start with education. The first question, Justin, is opening statements. Opening statements. Hi, everybody. My name is Justin Brannon. I'm running for city council, obviously. That's why I'm here. Um, I'm running in the neighborhood where I was born and raised. I'm actually the only Democrat on the stage tonight who was born and raised in the district. And I care very, very deeply about this community. Um, I certainly wasn't always involved in politics, far from it. Um, but I, I, I spent a lot of time touring uh, as a professional musician. Um, I think the last time I was actually on the stage was in a high school battle of the bands. Worked out well. Um, but I got involved because I really care so much about the community and I realized that local government was the place where I could affect um, the most change. There's three main issues that I hear the most about when I knock on doors and three issues that I'm focused on in my campaign. Transportation, education, and quality of life, especially for seniors. Um, transportation, you know, I'm the guy that gets things done. To be 37, I worked as part of a large coalition to bring that back. The 69th Street uh, Pier Ferry, I was the guy that really led the charge to bring that ferry back to 69th Street. And I'm proud to say that those things were both successful fights and they're here now. And now it's time to fix the R train. I think we all can agree on that, right? Um, I've been, I'm not proud to say it, but I've been calling for an overhaul of the MTA for a long time, way before it was front page news. Uh, my proposal for that is to, is to give some power back to the city. Right now, as, as most, most probably know, uh, the state legislature is the one that's in control of the MTA. So what does that mean? That means that politicians who represent towns in Buffalo and Rochester have more of a say over your daily commute than you and I or, or City Hall or the City Council does. And I think that's one of the first things that we really need to change. Um, I don't think it makes any sense for, for New York State to have control of our, our subways and buses. Uh, and one of the first things I would do if elected is pass a resolution to, to give power back to the city um, to, to take the reins of, uh, of our buses and subways. I consider education to be the nation's greatest equalizer. Access to high quality public education is a fundamental right. It's something that I benefited from. I was a a public school kid from PS185 in McKinley until uh, my parents tried to set me straight and sent me to the variant. Didn't, didn't work out. Um, but, I, but, but look, education is very important to me. My mother's a teacher, my wife is a teacher, my aunt is a teacher, my god, I think I'm the only one in my family that somehow did not become a teacher. Um, so it's, education is very important to me. And I'm, look, I'm the guy that I worked at the Department of Education, I helped expand. You know, a universal pre-K. When I got there, it was at 20,000 seats. And by that time I left, we were at 70,000 seats citywide. Uh, and I helped make that happen, along with the Community Schools Initiative. I think we could all agree, District 20 is one of the best school districts uh, in the city. It's been voted that since we were kids, right? But it's very, very overcrowded. There have only been a couple of new schools built, basically, since, since I was a kid. Uh, we need smaller class sizes. In order to do that, we need more schools. We need to let the teachers teach, we need to let the students learn, and we need to make sure that parents and kids know their rights while they're in school. I have one promise I'm making on this campaign is that if I'm elected in the first four years, we will have at least one new school built in the district. Good evening, everyone, and I first wanna thank everybody in this room for coming out tonight. Uh, it, it warms my heart as someone who's been involved in this community for a very long time, uh, almost uh, uh, almost 15 years at this point. Uh, it warms my heart to see this room so filled. So thank you all for coming, and I'm proud to be here to answer the questions, and great job, Vicky, for putting this together. So uh, my name is uh, Kevin Peter Carroll. I'm currently the Democratic District Leader in the 64th Assembly District, and we're in the 64th, so welcome to everyone uh, to the 64th. Uh, I am a member of Community Board 10. I've been on the Community Board since the age of 19. I uh, was the youngest member appointed at that time. Uh, and I just feel the community service is so important 
uh, in this community especially. Um, we have had uh, a, a real great time getting to know the neighbors. I have been the district leader for the last seven years and I've really learned the issues over uh, that time. Uh, and actually, uh, Justin is correct that we have three very important issues, transportation and education and uh, uh, certainly, uh, certainly accessibility issues, I would put in as the third, and government reform. So I was proud to be the first candidate when I ran for district leader uh, seven years ago to call for the MTA to be abolished and have state DOT and city DOT maintain control. Uh, as part of the B37 bus coalition on both ends of the district because I advocated for Bay Ridge uh, to get our bus back, but also as a staff member for council member Steve Levin, on the other end of the district, down to the other end of the uh, bus line, we also advocated and I organized on, on both sides to bring both communities together to finally bring back our B37 bus. And I thank Diane Savino for pointing that out in her newsletter. Um, you know, I've worked and testified and, and gone down. And a district leader is someone who, you know, you don't always see them, you don't always know, but this unpaid position is very important. And it gets people ready. And it gets people ready to run for the city council. And another very important issue, which is not addressed enough in this city, unfortunately, but I've seen it because my mom is in a wheelchair now, is accessibility issues with the MTA and with stores in general. We have no elevator service for our trains here in Bay Ridge, Tiger Heights, Bensoners, and Van Beach. That is a travesty. The fact is that if we have public use and public uh, institutions, they should be 100% accessible for every single person in this city. And so I am going to fight to make sure that that happens. <laughs> On education, education, we need to make sure that we get new schools in this district. It's going to be very difficult, but it is going to be a top priority of mine to find sites because the money is there to build the schools, you know? And we need to have greater oversight of this mayor who has mayoral control. The council needs to reassert itself, and I'm going to stand up and I'm going to do that. On a personal note, so that you know about me, I'm a straight talker. It sometimes gets me in trouble, but I'm a straight talker. Know that even if we disagree on an issue, which we're going to, that's what happens, and that, you know, no one agrees with a candidate 100%. Know that I will always be honest with you. I will always give you my opinion. And when I am your council member, my door will always be open for each and every one of you because I will serve you. This is your district. This is your seat. And I know that you will make the right decision. So I hope I have your support on September 12th and I look forward to answering all your questions. Perfect. I am joined tonight with my wife, Grace which this year will be celebrating our 25th anniversary and she is, yeah, and she is a public school nurse at PS204 and I have three of my four children joined me here tonight and they are all uh, products of the New York uh, public school system. So, so yeah, there you go. Uh, I, am, I am honored and pleased to be part of this race. Uh, this district is an extremely important district I care about it. I have been in community board 10 for the past 12 years. I am also a clergy liaison to the NYPD. I served in many different boards in this neighborhood, like the Augustana Lutheran Home, the San Nicholas Home, the Arab American Association for New York Board, because always I wanted to be engaged and involved. Uh, during my time of knocking on your doors, and I have knocked on over a thousand doors already, I have came to identify three important issues. Issue number one is affordability. Our tax this neighborhood is being unaffordable and taken over by developers. So we need to make sure we keep the housing affordable and the families who live here is staying here. The second thing is our transportation system. Let me put my political correctness aside. Our political, our transportation system is an awful. We have people in this district are one train away from losing their jobs. So we need to fight about a better transportation system. We need a transportation system, the MTA to be fully funded so it can function to serve the hardworking families who live in our district. The third issue, guys listen to me. 
Our children are dying in our streets because of the opioids, because of the illegal drugs. It starts with the prescription of the drugs, it moves on from there to other drugs, illegal drugs, heroin, and our children are dying in our streets. We need to engage them, we need to involve them, we need to bring resources, we need to make sure the agencies, the families are involved so we can save our children. These are important issues and we need to fight together, we need to mobilize and organize. And as your next council member, I will call the city council to do just that. My campaign is a grassroots campaign. I am a first-time candidate from outside of the political establishment who is committed to this neighborhood and to the people who live here. So in September 12th, it is an extremely important day. It's a day where we can make history. Either we can stay with the status quo or we can make history by electing a new leadership that is able to go to, go to city council and fight for us not to fight for the political establishment or for their political career. I don't care about my political career. I'm going only to fight for my family, for your family, because when I fight for my family, I'm fighting for you. And this is the time for us to rise, mobilize, organize, get engaged, get involved, because our community and the quality of life in our community is going down the drain. It is up to us to work together and come together to rescue this neighborhood and this district. Thank you so much and God bless you. Good evening, everybody. Tonight we competed with the weather, we competed with the Mets and the Yankees, and I thank you all for coming down despite all those things, and it's, it's democracy in action. So for anyone who's cynical about democracy with a small d, this is what they should come to see. So I thank you all for coming down. I thank the home reporter and Vicky and, uh, and, and Megan and my neighbor Christine uh, and Lori uh, for putting together this program. Uh, I also like to thank my family, uh, without whom I, could, I would not be here, I could not be here. I have my wife of 31 years, who's been my partner in all things. I don't know where I would be without her. Thank you for all your support. And of course, and of course, the two other reasons I live and breathe every day, my son Marco, my daughter Isabella, thank you both for allowing me to take time out and do this. Um, and I want to thank the other candidates for coming down. You know, nine, this community has gotten nine different viewpoints on the issues. So if that's not democracy in action, I don't know what is. So each of us has been asked to come down tonight to talk to you about what makes each of us believe that we're best suited to be a next council member. Here's my story. I'm an immigrant. I was born in Richard Calabria, Italy. My family came here when I was seven. We settled into Harway Avenue and Bay 47th. I'm the proud, public, uh, the proud product of the New York City public school system. I learned the English language in two months because there were tutors back then that took you out of the classroom to teach you the English language. My father was a butcher, my mother was a seamstress, and it was because of her hard work and her membership in the then ILGWU and now UNITE, thank you, that has allowed my parents to live the American dream. Their American dream was saving up enough money to buy a house, and they did that. They did that in Diker Heights. And because of that, I've lived in Beth Beach and Diker Heights my entire life since I was seven. Now, my wife and I have saved over the years, and we went to law school. And why do I mention that? Why is it important to be a lawyer and be a council member? I'm the only lawyer in the race, okay? And the reason that's important is because I have 25 years of experience bringing people together, advocating zealously for when it's necessary. Um, I, I'm an appellate lawyer. And bringing people together and building coalitions to solve problems on important issues that we're faced with, that the council ought to be faced with. You know, so much time has been wasted in the past four years on issues like five cent plastic bag fees and, uh, and, and the issues about carriage horses that we've lost sight of the important issues of education and transportation and tax issues that really affect this community or are going to affect this community in the next four years. So, um, so I think that it's very important to, to have had that 25 years of experience. But my living the American dream has allowed me to give back to my community. I'm a member of Community Board 11. I'm the chair of the Committee on Health, Social Services, and Seniors. We build coalitions to solve the opioid problem one person at a time. I'm the chair of a group called Opportunities for Better Tomorrow. We provide 
tough love, uh, workforce access, and college access, and jobs, and internships, and disconnected young adults, 2,000 a year, one at a time. We need to do more. I'm the president of MECO, which runs the second largest senior center in this community. We make 400 meals a day to seniors, one at a time. We need to do more for those as well. Uh, and I'm the vice president of the Dyker Heights Knights, where we provide, we teach, personal responsibility and teamwork to 5 to 14 year olds. So whether you're a, uh, a young child, a young adult, a hardworking member of the community, or a senior center. Time's up. Uh, I, I would give, you, uh, give, give us a, a, an opportunity. To Thank you. I'm Nancy Tom. I have worked for the Assemblyman William Colton of the 47th Assembly District for the past eight years. Before I was working in his office, I was a volunteer. I volunteered starting when the age my son went to school at pre-K, around four years old. That's the time I started doing volunteer work all the time, helping people. I also help in the school being the teacher's assistant. Until eight years ago, as a volunteer, when the assemblyman came up to me and said, Nancy, would you like to have a job in my office? I said to myself, I've been doing volunteer work all these years for free. Now I have an opportunity. Of course, I say, yeah, it's a career for free. Now I'm getting paid for. For the past eight years, I have assisted over 10,000 constituents many who have expressed personal concerns to me, such as domestic violence, abuse, or loss of a spouse. My woman's intuition and empathy serve as a bridge connecting myself with those who confided in me. When my parents and I immigrated from Hong Kong, they were able to find affordable housing easily for my family of 10. Nowadays, it is extremely difficult for new immigrants and even college graduates to secure affordable housing. Even senior citizens, many who have grown up in New York or affected. The rising cost of rent puts them at a risk for missing payments if elected. I wish to combat this by obtaining city funding for both affordable housing and senior housing. I am also a mother and woman. If elected, I will make history as the first Asian woman legislator in Brooklyn. It will be a victory for minority groups, immigrant communities, and women Currently, there are only 13 women in the council, city council out of 51 city council members. However, women constitute more than half of the population. This does not accurately represent the diversity of Brooklyn. I will do my absolute best to fight for my constituents to have a good quality of life Time is up. living here. Time's up. Great to be back here at Severian. Um, I was a, a proud graduate here, class of 1991. I have one minor regret, and that is I wish 26 years ago we turned co-ed here. But what are you going to do? Um, but it is ironic how things come full circle. Full circle. Being here as a, a student at Severian High School, and now here as a, a city council candidate. Um, I'm certainly uh, proud of uh, my long record of. Uh, service here. Um, one of the things I'm most proud of is my time as uh, with the 68th Precinct Youth Council. And I just believe now more than ever, 
we need some sanity and common sense in the city council. And I think that my record in the private and public sector enables me to bring a unique perspective to the city council. I believe I have the broadest resume of all the Republican candidates. I have, for example, right out of college, I was a grocery manager with a supermarket. Then I became a regional sales manager for New York and New Jersey for a uh, beverage company. And then I also, for the past eight years, I've been a supermarket manager with uh, Gristini's, where I'm responsible for over 50 uh, employees and about $6 million in annual sales. So I know what it means to meet a payroll, make a budget, and deal with the constant headaches of city, state, and federal regulations. You know, I just believe that when you're in the council, it's good to have somebody there. So if a business person comes to you and says, hey, Bob, I'm having problems with this new business recycling law, which, by the way, just took effect the first of this month, I can directly relate to that. If a business person comes to me and says, you know what, there's big problems with the city law regulating cooling towers relating to Legionnaire's disease outbreak that happened a couple years ago, I know exactly what they mean because I deal with those issues on a constant basis. I've also been a high school social studies teacher at St. Edmunds High School, and I've been an adjunct professor of political science for the past 15 years at John Jay College of Criminal Justice and also at Kingsborough Community College and St. Uh, St. Francis College. And, uh, and on that note of, of being an adjunct professor of political science, whenever I teach um, the chapter about the national government and the Constitution and the framers, they always talk about this idea of citizen legislators, people who would serve their time in the private sector and serve for a little while in the public sector. I think that's what we need to get back to rather than just having these career politicians. But I'm also proud of the time that I've served in the public sector. I've, I've worked with Brooklyn's top elected Democrats and Republicans. And that's why I'm the only one on this stage can, that can say that. I work in a senior position as Director of Community Relations with Brooklyn Borough President Marty Markowitz. I was proud to serve as district director to former Congressman Bob Turner. By the way, he's the one who made national headlines when he replaced Anthony Weiner. So together, we're going to make a difference, and maybe we can use some unity these days, as I have demonstrated all my life. Thank you. Bill de Blasio is the greatest force against all that is good in this city. Let's talk about the 800-pound gorilla in this room. Whether you go ahead. Republican, everywhere you go across this city, you realize that Bill de Blasio is the one force for good and bad, and all he does is bad. Every issue that my opponents have, have articulated, whether it's education, whether it's transportation, whether it's crime and safety, whether it's housing, the reality is the mayor of New York has the power to fix or to destroy. Whoever you elect has got to have the guts and the passion to go against Bill de Blasio, 100%. By the way, I'm William McKay, I want uh, Born and raised in this neighborhood, went to Our Lady of Angels, uh, Bishop Ford High School, St. Francis College downtown. Um, had some humble beginnings in this neighborhood, and uh, one of the things I like to say on the stump is this neighborhood raised me up um, when I was down. It, it helped. Uh, put my family together many times. And uh, some of the people that, that were responsible for that are here in this room, and I want to take this time to say thank you. This is the reason why I'm running. I am willing to give back to this community, the community that gave me so much, and helped me through tough times, and helped my family through tough times. Um, I think I bring some compassion to the conservatism that I have. Many of you know this, my father was homeless. He was homeless here in this community, and uh, he died homeless, and uh, I bring that uh, that story to uh, to try to create policy that is that is both compassionate at the same time understands that letting people live on the streets in frigid weather is is not compassionate. Now let me talk to you. Let's talk about the issues that I hear and, and every issue, whether it's uh, education, overcrowded schools, 
whether it's infrastructure and transportation, whether it's crime, it can be traced to one particular issue in South Brooklyn, and that is illegal home conversions. That is absolutely, absolutely my signature issue. I want to talk about all those things. And I haven't heard anyone talk about it more to the, to the depth that they, we need to. When you talk about overcrowded schools, we have some schools that are at 170% capacity. That's related uh, to legal home conversions. When you talk about our sanitation issues, that's related to legal home conversions. Instead of sanitation workers have to, ha have to pick up garbage for 100 people on the block, we now have to pick up uh, garbage for 200 people on the block, 300 people on the block. When you talk about transportation, when we have uh, trains that are at capacity, I've never seen the D train or the R train in the state they're in. It, it is related to illegal home conversions. And the reason why I bring up that issue is because so many of these issues are standard city council issues, and I, I don't mean to disparage those issues, but taking on illegal home conversions is gonna take the guts, the same guts that I've shown taking on the mayor of New York. And I'll give you an example. They weren't picking up the trash on Barwell Terrace and many of the terraces in this neighborhood. I took the trash literally to the mayor's doorstep, and he agreed. His office was elected. Some of the people out there agree that. The mayor's office agreed uh, to sit down with the people of Bay Ridge uh, to, to, to take care of that issue, and he has lied. To this to this point, uh, he has not he has not met with them, and that is symbolic of what's going on in this city. As he famously said, he doesn't care. So I'll, I want to leave you with this. Remember when you go to that voting booth. Out of all nine of us, one person has to take on Bill de Blasio. I want to be that person. Thank you very much. I was born and raised in this community. I went to St. Francis Cabrini Grammar School, witnessed the closing of that school, attended Bishop Carney High School, and with the help and love and support of my parents, graduated with honors from Fordham University. There are several issues that concerns community. The main thing is the illegal conversions. And because of these illegal conversions, a lot of the constituents have been telling me that their real estate taxes have gone through the roof. And we're not talking about a nominal increase. Some of these real estate taxes have doubled and gone astronomically over the budget. Most of the people that live in the 43rd Council District are what we call a NORG, a naturally occurring retirement community. They're on a fixed income. They cannot afford these increases. We need to find a way to make it more affordable for our seniors to stay in their homes and stay in place. You know, all of my opponents, thank you all for being here, and we have nine of them, but not one mentioned something very important and something that I grew up with and took part of and ran. And that is being a small business manager. There are so many small businesses in our community that are struggling. They're struggling to make the payroll. They're struggling to survive because they are, the city is constantly raising revenues on these small businesses through fines. They are imposing wages on small business owners that they cannot afford. And I can tell you from personal experience, there have been many times where employees have received payroll, and the owners have not, just to keep their business going. And the small businesses are the backbone of this community because they put the people in the community to work. They get the high school kids off the streets, and they teach them something. And they also do one thing that's valuable in this world. They teach these young people a trade. I know we're all based on academics, but I don't know about you, I have never met a poor plumber. I have never met a poor electrician or anybody that uses their hands to earn a living. And we need to support that for our young people. <laughs> Something else that was brought to my attention not too long ago, and it is an important issue, going back to some of the senior citizens and people on fixed and limited incomes. A lot of them are pet owners. These pets are their companions. They're a company for them. They keep them occupied, but to go and take care of a pet, the cost is astronomical for some of these seniors and people on fixed incomes. As your city councilwoman, I will help and make sure that those that have limited income or a fixed income will have enough resources and be helped to take care of their pets 
So they don't have to put them down, and they don't have to put them out into the street. And also something else, a lot of people complain about feral cats. Well, as your city councilwoman, I will implement a trap and neuter program. Because they need to be fixed and they need to stay in the area. Time's up. Thank you very much. Good evening. Thank you, Victoria. Thank you to the Brooklyn Home Reporter and the Spectator for hosting this debate tonight, which outlines a big, uh, big array of characters and candidates for the uh, for the seat here. Um, in, in September, we have an important primary. This is a very important race, something that we haven't seen here in over 14 years with an open election. And so that's why I think this is a great opportunity for all of you here, and thank you for attending. This debate also gives an opportunity for the Republicans in the room to understand that there are four Republicans in the race. I've been knocking on doors throughout the district since March, and recently I've been finding out that candidates are saying there's only one Republican in the race. So that's not true. There are four of us, and you'll have a choice on September 12th. I believe I am the most qualified and proud to have been endorsed by Senator Marty Holden, I know is here. United Firefighters Association, United Fire Officers Association in the primary, the Correction Officers, the Detectives Endowment Association, the Port Authorities, so Sergeants Benevolent Association, the Uniform Sanitation Officers in the primary, the Carpenters, the John Jay College Republicans, and more. The race is not about endorsements, it's not about candidates, it's not about future or, or career. It's about one thing, it's about confidence and how we can stand up and fight against City Hall, so that they respect this district, that they respect this portion of Brooklyn and what we need. We need a leader that will fight to eliminate the five cent bottle refund. We need to stop the crazy garbage tax. We need to fight and make sure that community notification is required before City Bike takes any parking spaces away from us. We need to develop an Eyes on the Street, an electronic video database program to help crime prevention and help our police officers catch the bad guys in the wake of the increase in petty larceny in the six day precinct. When you see something, you photograph something and send it to the cops. It's that simple. Why is this neighborhood a cash and ATM for the, for the tickets? Why do parking violations make it harder to fight parking tickets? They closed night court for parking violations bureau, forcing the small business owners that are the heart of this neighborhood to take off from work or keep their store closed so they can go down in the middle of the day and fight against the tickets. And that's something that we will fight to reopen that court. Someone has to stand up for this community. I am the candidate with the proven record. For 19 years, I have stood, stood alongside of one of the most honorable public servants I've ever met. We've fought for people. We've opened the school for autistic children. We've got ramps installed on the beach in Coney Island so the disabled and those in wheelchairs can access the beach. We've helped people fight water bills that are overcharged. We've helped people fix their sidewalk, prune their trees. That's what a city council member is supposed to do. I'm excited about this race, and I look forward to uh, winning in September, September 12th, and I believe that I will be the strongest candidate to go forward in November to take on our Democratic opponent and to fight against Bill de Blasio and the insanity coming out of City Hall. Before I conclude, I would be remiss not to say that we just saw a tragedy over this weekend with Charlottesville. And this community has for decades sent men and women from Fort Hamilton and from throughout this neighborhood to go fight in wars, to stop against Nazism and fascism, to shine and be the beacon of light throughout this world. This is the greatest country in the world. And for us not to condemn what happened in Charlottesville, is to spit on the graves of all those who died. Do not demand a federal investigation is disgraceful, and our leaders need to come to their senses. Time's up! I just would like to offer a moment of silence to remember the two police officers and the woman that passed away in an act of terrorism this past weekend. So if everyone can offer a moment of silence. Marty are you here or if not, we want to say thank you for all the service you give and these wonderful candidates are here thanks to 
this beautiful school. So I want a round of applause for Zavarian for hosting us here tonight. And it's really remarkable to see the fabulous turnout from the advertisements of this debate in our newspapers. The power of the press locally is alive and well. So now we begin our second round. Megan, take it away. Okay, now we're going to go into questions. We're going to start with Dems, and we're going to... Okay. Thank you. Speak up, girl. We're going to start with the Democrats. Remember, you have one minute each to answer the question. Keep it quick. There are nine of you. And then we're going to go right into the Republicans. Same question. Switching the format a little bit. So we're going to... Everyone will answer the same question. Exactly. So remember, one minute on the clock. We're going to start with education, and we're going to start with Justin. The question is, what are your solutions for the overcrowding in schools in this district? Thank you. Thank you, Megan. Um, yeah, one of the things I mentioned in my opening statement, uh, District 20 is, uh, has been historically voted one of the best school districts in the city. Uh, there's a reason for that, and it's very popular, and people keep coming here because they hear how good it, uh, our district is. Um, there's not one school that isn't at least 140% overcrowded, so that's a big problem. We have to prioritize finding, when, when real estate becomes available, we have to prioritize making sure that this real estate, instead of becoming expensive condos, can become a school or senior housing. Uh, I worked for the Department of Education for about three years. I was very close to the flame on a lot of issues, and one of the biggest issues was working with the School Construction Authority's Real Estate Division, which literally goes around neighborhoods and tries to locate plots of land where we can build schools. We need to get creative, and we need to build more schools. That's the bottom line. And one of the only promise I'm making in this campaign is that in the first four years, if I'm elected, we will have at least one new school built in this district. Thank you. It, very important, this is a, a top issue in our neighborhood. And as a member of Community Board 10, every single time uh, a new school was put forward, uh, I always supported uh, the building of that school. I think it's a shame that over the last few years, uh, we have not seen more, more schools built. Uh, and I will make this a top priority. One of the ways that I'm going to do that is I'm going to implement a council of uh, PTAs uh, and have all the PTAs from the different public schools in our district uh, represented. And one of the, the, the things I hope comes out of that is a committee to help find new spaces uh, in, uh, to build the new schools. Uh, it's very, very important, a top priority. We have to engage our par the parents who uh, uh, who are going to send their children to these schools and get them involved and help us find uh, help us find sites as well as working with government and whatnot. And we need that partnership, and it's a shame that it hasn't happened over the last few years. Uh, but I will make sure that it happens. Thank you. As I said, I'm a proud father of four children, all of them who went to the public school system in New York City. I am very very supportive of the New York City public schools. And I think before we go and think about building new schools, we need to fund and make sure the existing schools are fully funded and fully equipped. And our teachers have all the resources they need so they can continue to teach our children and, and give them the best opportunity in life to be competitive in the marketplace. So I, I will continue as a city council member to fight for our uh, public schools and make sure no resources are taken away from our public schools and given to charter schools or given to other resources. We need to make sure our tax money goes directly to support our public schools and our public schools only. Thank you. Thank you. Going around in, in the past couple months, and actually for years, what I've heard over and over again is how much money, how many billions of dollars go to the uh, public education system in the city of New York and the state of New York, and how uh, the money actually doesn't get to the classroom. And I'm sure those of us who have teachers in our families probably are very familiar with the fact that we, we, the teachers spend a lot of money out of their own pockets to go and buy supplies. Okay, so what's the problem here? I read an article from the Daily News from two days ago that says billions at risk according to an education audit. No one knows where the money's going. That's an issue with regard to different agencies in the city. 
that whether it's transportation, whether it's education, whether it's the parks department, there are bills sitting in the city council that ask for transparency in government. We don't have it. We need to fight for it, we need to know where our money's going, and we have to get money in the teacher's hands, in the classroom, in order to get to the children as much as possible. We need to fight for that in the city council. Now, exactly. now the overcrowding of a school, we can do extensions. Finding uh, buildings where we can build extensions for the existing schools, or converting nearby buildings. This is very important. And as the charter school, they should not be putting charter school into our public school. Yeah. So this way we will bring up the more seats will be allowed for our public schools. And District 20 is really, really crowded. And we also need to look for space where we can build. Building it, it takes a long time. So what I suggest is do extensions, find whatever we can find that it's a nearby, so we can have that extension. I actually have a very different review than the Kitty Elliott team. I happen to think there is a problem with our public schools, and maybe the answer is making it easier for parents to send their kids to charter parochial schools. I think we should provide education tax credits. My dad worked his butt off. My dad worked his butt off with the Department of Sanitation for 20 years and second jobs in 70 of schools. And I think every parent should offer this, get some relief to allow their children to come to schools like this. And also, it's a matter of budgetary priorities. It takes money to build schools. So perhaps if we put an end to some of the city's sanctuary city policies, like spending $27 million to defend those here illegally who commit felonies for deportation, perhaps we would have more money to build more public schools. You know, listen to the Democrats' answers, right? Listen to their answers. Build more schools, build more schools, build more schools. The answer is not overcrowding. How are we going to stop overcrowding? I said it already. We have got to stop illegal home conversions. How do you think you've seen such a, a, a population growth? We can't build schools fast enough, and we can't even find the real estate fast enough if we wanted to. And Bob is exactly right. We have to provide tax credits. You, you want to relieve the, the population of schools? This is a Catholic institution. I went to Catholic school. Vouchers for, for our Catholic school students, tax credits. You have, you have a very large Catholic population in this community. And you need a city council person who's going to represent those interests and fight for that at, at City Hall. Thank you. Some have set up here. The illegal conversions is definitely a number, a concern that has impacted the overcrowding in the schools. In 2003-2004, they had a, a lawsuit called a Campaign for Fiscal Equity. And the state, the pair, uh, organization sued the state and the city for money to help reduce the overcrowding. And they reached a settlement, and this district was awarded funding through the efforts of Senator Golden to fill 10,000 more seats. And they told us, that's what we need. We need 10,000 more seats. And in the last 10 years, 11 years, we've built 10,000 more seats. You just look up and down 4th Avenue, you look in the schoolyards, in the Bath Beach, Bath Avenue. But the illegal conversions, as just said, has amplified the problem to a point where we're out of control and we can't maintain the numbers that are coming out of the houses. So in case you had two kids coming out of your house, if you have five families living there, you could potentially have 10 kids zoned for the same school. My wife's an assistant principal. They have four lunch periods. My daughter's in a... In a Time's up. 